In this video, I will introduce you to configuring models in Burn P3 Plus, a spatial fire simulation package for Synchrosim. For an introduction to the Synchrosim modeling platform, installation and getting started materials for Burn P3 Plus, or an introduction to the role of Burn P3 Plus in the broader fire modeling space, please see the links in the description. Over the course of this video, we will step through an example library and take a detailed look at the different options available to configuring your Burn P3 Plus simulations. Along the way, we will explore different ways of moving data into and out of your models, examine the information you will need to model your own systems in Burn P3 Plus, and discuss the modular structure of a Burn P3 Plus simulation. In this library, we will model a small section of Glacier National Park, located roughly 60 kilometers north of the town of Revelstoke. This landscape consists of just over 100,000 cells and is modeled at a resolution of 100 meters. Two spatial inputs are required for any Burn P3 Plus simulation. First, a map of the fuels present in the landscape, as shown here, and second, a digital elevation map in meters. For the sake of simplicity, we will assume that the goal of this example model is to simulate several burn seasons to assess fire risk across the landscape. However, it is worth keeping in mind that this is not the only use case for Burn P3+. Please see the Parisian et al. paper linked in the description for more information. Please also note that this model is only meant as a demonstration and not as an actual fire risk assessment for the area. Much of the data is fabricated and many of the modeling decisions made were specifically to demonstrate different configuration options. We are now ready to look at the model in Synchrosim. As with all models in Synchrosim, Burn P3 Plus models are organized into three hierarchical levels. At the top, we have the library, which corresponds to a .sim file on disk. This contains a project, which is where we define variables that are shared across the entire model. And finally, each project can contain one or more scenarios, which parameterize the simulations themselves. Each of these levels contains a different collection of data sheets that can be used to configure the model. To access these different collections of configuration options, we can simply double click on any one of these objects. Over the next section of this video, we will walk through each of these three levels in turns to look at the different ways we can interact with Burn P3+. We will start by looking at the library scope properties for the model. First, under the summary tab, we can see some general metadata about the library, as well as information about the package that the library is built on, as well as information about the file on disk. Next, under the add-ons tab, we can see which add-on packages we have enabled for the library. Add-on packages are used to extend or modify the behavior of Burn P3+, and among other things, are used to provide support for different fire growth models. In this model, we're using the Prometheus add-on package to grow our fires, but configuration will be very similar with the other currently available fire growth add-on package, Cell to Fire. For more information on both of these fire growth models and their respective add-on packages, please see the links in the description. Other potential uses of future add-on packages could be for pre- and post-processing spatial layers, or fetching and uploading data to and from web sources. It is also worth noting that Burn P3 Plus and the currently available add-on packages are all open source. Our goal is for the future direction of this tool to ultimately be driven by the fire simulation community. This would involve improvements to the currently available packages, but also the development of new add-on packages to support the workflows users are interested in. Please see our GitHub and Discord links in the description to get involved. The remaining configuration options at the library scope are not specific to Burn P3 Plus and largely relate to how Synchrosim should manage external files and run simulation code. Please see the Synchrosim documentation linked in the description for more information about these options. Next, we have the project scope properties. At this level, the only mandatory configurations are all in the fuels tab. First, under the fuels types datasheet, we must define all of the fuels that are present in our landscape, as well as matching them to their corresponding pixel values in our fuels map. 
By right clicking here or in any other data sheet in Synchrosim, we can show or hide different optional columns. Next, under the Prometheus Crosswalk datasheet, we must tie each of our user-defined fuel types to one of the fuel codes that are understood by Prometheus. As different fire growth models can use different fuel code systems, this is an important step to making Burn P3 Plus fire growth model agnostic. If we were to use multiple fire growth models in this library, for example, to compare Prometheus and Celta Fire, we would need to construct a separate crosswalk for each fire growth model. Next, we can take a look at some of the optional configuration options found under the Advanced tab. The first four data sheets here are used to define variables that we can use to stratify our ignitions. This can be useful, for example, to ensure that fires burned in different seasons experience different burning conditions. Two of these variables, seasons and causes, are aspatial and are assigned when the ignitions are drawn. The other two, fire zones and weather zones, are spatial and depend only on where the ignition locations are sampled. Here we can see the zone maps for this library. The map loosely splits the landscape into higher and lower elevations, which, for example, may experience very different weather regimes. In this model, we've chosen to use the same map for both the fire zone and the weather zone, but this is not a requirement. The final data sheet in this tab is used to define distributions. We will return to this data sheet once we get to our, the scenario scope. Before we move on to configuring our scenario, it would be helpful to be clear on the four key steps that go into a full round of simulation in Burn P3+. First, we need to sample our ignitions. This is where we decide how many ignitions to sample in each simulated burn season or iteration, and where to place these ignitions in space. Next, for each of these fires, we want to know how long the fire should burn. This includes sampling the number of days of active spreading, but also the number of hours the fire should burn for each of those days. In addition, we also need to sample the fire weather conditions that the ignition should experience for each day of burning. These two steps encompass the entirety of the stochasticity of the model. Once we have sampled the ignitions and burn conditions, these can be passed on to the deterministic half of the simulation. First, we run them through the deterministic fire growth step. And finally, once the, you have the outputs of the fire growth models, which may have been run over many threads or even different nodes on a cluster, we need to collate these results and calculate any summary burn metrics across all iterations. Back in Synchrosim, we can now take a look at the scenario scope properties. First, under the general tab, we can find the pipelines data sheet. Here, we can determine which of the four simulation steps we want to run in this scenario. In this model, we are simply running all four steps in a single scenario. However, this modular approach has a number of benefits. For one, this is how Burn P3 Plus provides support for multiple fire growth models. If we had enabled the cell to fire add-on package, we would see that we would have multiple entries here corresponding to how we grow our fires. In addition, we also have the option of running these simulation steps across multiple scenarios. This can be useful, for example, for very large simulations, as we will have an opportunity to assess the outputs of each of these steps before proceeding on to the following. This can help us catch errors very quickly before we run to the very long step of actually growing our fires. The pipelines data sheet is also a good way to see how the configuration options are organized in the scenario scope. Putting aside the run control and landscape map tabs, which correspond, which relate to all of our simulation steps, each of the following um, tabs at the scenario scope correspond one to one with one of our simulation steps. Next, we will jump around a bit and take a look at a few different data sheets out of order to explore the ways in which you can sample from distributions in Burn P3 Plus. There are three places in a Burn P3 Plus simulation where numbers must be drawn from distributions. First, when deciding the number of ignitions to sample in each iteration. Second, when deciding the number of days of active spreading for each fire. And lastly, when deciding the number of hours of burning for each burn day. We will take a look at each of these in turn. To start, we can navigate to the Sample Ignitions tab to find the Ignitions Count data sheet. Here, we can see an example of the most straightforward way to interact with these data sheets is simply to specify a single deterministic value. Although this is generally unrealistic, 
it can be useful to isolate the effects of other model parameters. More commonly, however, you might want to sample these values from a statistical distribution. To do this, we can right click and show the distribution and SD columns. These columns are used to decide a statistical distribution to sample from, as well as to further parameterize this distribution. So here, this ignition count column is used to define the mean of the distribution. In an empty library, Burn P3 Plus provides two built-in statistical distributions, the normal and the gamma. We will cover these other two distributions in just a moment. Moving on to our second use case for distribution, we can navigate to the sample burning conditions tab to find the spread event days data sheet. As before, you can see that we are sampling from our built-in distributions. However, this time we're using the fire zones column to sample from distri different distributions for different types of ignitions. Note that the fire zone column here is optional, and we could instead stratify by season or any combination of season and fire zone. Alternatively, we could also sample from a single distribution as before. Finally, another very common use case is sampling from discrete empirical distributions, such as historical data. To do this, we must first define and parameterize our own user-defined distributions. To begin, we first go to the project scope definitions. Here, under the advanced tab, under the distributions data sheet, we can define new distributions that we can later parameterize. To use these distributions, we first need to go into our advanced tab at the scenario scope this time, and down here under the distributions data sheets. For each of these distributions, we can decide the values that should occur within the distribution as well as their relative frequencies. Once we've done this, we can now go to one of our data sheets, for example, under sample burning conditions, our last sampling data sheet, daily burning hours, and use these distributions just as we would one of the built in distributions. Here, I'm stratifying the daily burning hours by season, but again, this is an optional stratification. With that, we can turn our attention back to the remaining configuration options for sampling ignitions. First, we have the ignition locations data sheet, which we can use to provide probabilistic grids encoding the relative likelihoods for where ignitions should be sampled. As with other tables, these options can be stratified by season and cause. If this table is left empty, ignitions will be sampled uniformly across the landscape. Next, we have the ignition restrictions table, where we can determine which fuel types are not valid locations for ignitions to occur. Again, these decisions can be stratified by season, cause, and fire zone. And lastly, we have the ignition distribution table, where we can determine how sampled ignitions should be partitioned between seasons, causes, and fire zone. If any variables are not specified here, such as causes in this example, ignitions will be uniformly assigned to one of the valid groups. Moving on to the remaining options for sampling burn conditions, we can navigate to the corresponding tab to find the daily weather data sheet. Each row of this data sheet corresponds to one day of fire weather, which can optionally be stratified by season and weather zone. As these weather tables can get very large, it will generally be impractical to manually insert this data. Instead, we can right click on this or any data sheet in Syncrosyn and import the data from a CSV or Excel file. Here I'll choose to overwrite the data. See that we've imported this new data set. Similarly, we can export any data sheet in Syncrosyn as well if we would like to explore or manipulate this data in other tools. Finally, under the advanced note, we can see that we can find the weather sampling options. Here we can simply decide whether we want sequential burn days to receive sequential weather records from our daily weather table. This is generally advisable if your weather is sequential. Next, under the fire growth model options, we have the option to override the fire growth model's defaults for green up, curing, and grass fuel loading. Each of these, in turn, can also be specified by season if we choose. If the fire growth model supports it, we can also provide wind grids. Moving on to our summary transformer, we just need to decide which outputs we'd like to keep. So we have a tabular output, which includes fire statistics, such as the burn area of each of our fires. Um, but there are also spatial outputs, such as our burn probability maps, burn count maps, and burn perimeters. 
Finally, if there are any fire growth model specific outputs, such as for Prometheus, we can also specify which ones we'd like to keep here. And with that, you're done configuring a model and you're ready to run your scenario. You can do this by right clicking your scenario and selecting run. Here, I've already done the run ahead of time, so I can expand the scenario by clicking here and find my result scenarios. So every time a scenario is run, it produces a new result scenario, and these can be interacted with in much the same way as regular scenarios. So by double clicking, I can open the scenario properties as before, but here you'll see that most of the fields are grayed out. And that's because a result scenario serves as a static snapshot of all of the inputs that went into a given run. Additionally, there are some new tabs like this output fire statistic table. Here we can see the tabular outputs that we requested during our configuration of our output options. As before, if you're just interested in getting this data out and analyzing it, you can right click and select export all and then bring in the CSV or Excel file into whatever tools you're more comfortable analyzing your data in. We can also right click our results scenario and add it to our results here. This allows us to make use of Syncrosim's built-in exploratory visualization tools. For example, down here in the charts menu, you can see some charts that I have prepared ahead of time. I double click here. You can see on this left menu that I've chosen to plot burn area and disaggregate it by season. So using these options, we can see that fires grown in the summer were on average much larger than the fires grown in the spring. Similarly, I have a few map templates prepared ahead of time. So for example, here we can see a relative burn probability map for the entire landscape. As before, we can pan around, we can use the inspect tool to get at the exact values of specific pixels. We can also modify our legends to pretty it up as we'd like. Finally, if you're just interested in getting this data out of Syncrosim and into, again, one of your analysis tools that you are more familiar with, you can come to this export tab here and pick any variable that you're interested in and double click it to pick a folder on disk where you'd like to export all these outputs. And alternatively, you can use the R Syncrosim package for R or the Py Syncrosim package for Python to directly interface with Syncrosim libraries so that you can access the tabular and spatial inputs and outputs directly in your coding environments. This can help create more reproducible workflows and are some of the first steps towards developing your own add-on packages for Burn P3+. Thank you for watching.